Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about the very serious topic of terrorism. We'll discuss what motivates it as well as why various groups around the world resort to terrorism to try to affect public opinion and public policy. My guest today is Dr. Charles Mahoney. Dr. Mahoney is an assistant professor of political science. Welcome, Charles, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me here. I'm really uh, excited to be here. As we talk about terrorism, the images of 9-11 are etched into our memories forever. 9-11 is a day that will live in infamy, just as FDR described uh, the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. Any trip to the airport today is a sober reminder of the threats that we face today. But in order to have a meaningful conversation about terrorism, we have to put some parameters around it, and we have to be able to define what its distinctive characteristics are. So how do we define terrorism, and what are its characteristics? Right. Well, terrorism is often used uh, interchangeably in the media, alongside words such as insurgency, guerrilla warfare, militants. But it does have a set academic uh, definition, and that would be uh, the use of violence or threat of violence against civilian non-combatants in order to achieve a political or social objective. So terrorism can be distinguished from guerrilla warfare, which primarily targets combatants, uh, conventional warfare, which is the militaries of two countries targeting, uh, targeting each other, uh, and then crime, which is violence intended to uh, gain profit for uh, an individual or organization. Um, so it actually has a very set limited definition, even though it's often used interchangeably uh, with a lot of other words um, involving political violence in the media. Well, let's talk about the term combatants versus non-combatants. Explore that a little bit more with us. Sure. Um, uh, a civilian is somebody who's not a member of a country's armed forces or a member of a recognized militia a guerrilla organization, a, a group um, carrying out a civil war against a, a government. Um, so a combatant is someone who's actively involved uh, in combat uh, and really in a situation in which both sides know that there's a, a militant conflict uh, going on. Um, civilian is just you know, someone who isn't part of those two recognized armed forces. Um, someone who's often considered to be sort of outside the context of a conflict and innocent in a lot of ways. And so essentially if you attack civilians who are not involved in any aspect of the armed forces that would be considered an act of terrorism because you're, act, you're acting against citizens who are not aligned with the military. Right, as, as long as it's to achieve a, a political or social objective. Um, so terrorism can be carried out by individuals, you know, a famous example of that is the Unabomber, uh, organizations like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, or governments. In fact, uh, throughout history, governments are um, the primary culprits when it comes to terrorism, targeting civilians rather than militants in an effort to uh, maintain control over a country or achieve some kind of um, political objective. And in today's world, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, there's kind of a muddying of the waters here in terms of who's doing what to whom and why they're doing it. So let's talk about the motivation for terrorism. What are the typical motivations for terrorist acts? Um, well, often terrorism is carried out by groups that, um, uh, when it's an organization, that aren't very uh, powerful. It's a, f it's a form of leverage uh, or uh, asymmetric conflict. So terrorism is uh, used often by small, weaker groups um, to try and get uh, attention that they otherwise normally wouldn't be able to get, um, and also to, um, to recruit, um, to gain uh, media attention outside the country, to influence foreign governments. Um, there, are many, there can be many audiences of terrorist attacks, and terrorism can be carried out for you know, a, a variety of, of different reasons. Um, uh, it can be uh, intended to intimidate populations, um, who uh, uh, specific populations in society who might be practicing specific religion, members of a, a specific political party. So the, the motivations, if you're asking about the motivations of terrorism, can come from a lot of different places. But typically, when organizations use it um, exclusively, or that is their major strategy, 
Um, we often uh, see them as smaller, weaker organizations compared to the targets that they're trying to influence. And then in that sense, it's a form of uh, leverage that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have. And terrorists often use the media as uh, a main source of uh, disseminating their information. So they, in a sense, uh, allow the media to do that, uh, that bidding for them in terms of getting the word out to the public. Right. Um, there's a, a, a famous uh, phrase used about a lot of terrorism that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s, um, which stated that terrorists want a lot of people watching, but not a lot of people dead. Now, that's not necessarily true today. A lot of terrorism that occurs today is more coercive and destructive in nature. But the first part of that is still definitely true. Terrorists want a lot of people watching, uh, paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, and when, when we think about what a terrorist group is trying to achieve um, by carrying out uh, an act of terrorism, it's not, it's not influencing the actual victims of a terrorist attack. Um, for the terrorist group, the victims are uh, inconsequential, right? It's the, it's the larger audiences that they're trying to influence, achieve, uh, make uh, aware of their grievances, of their objectives, um, of their ideology. Um, so the media and coverage of a terrorist group by the media uh, is essential in a lot of ways uh, for the group to um, not necessarily be successful, but to increase recruitment, uh, increase uh, reception of material resources, funding, money, um, and in general to become part of the public discourse. And if we look at recent examples of uh, journalists being kidnapped and then ultimately beheaded, and then that, uh, that video being released to the media, what are the kinds of messages that the terrorists are trying to send out and what are their objectives in that? Okay, well, um, uh, d specifically kidnapping members of the media, it, it, it could potentially be about negative coverage about the group, but my guess is that um, they feel that if they capture a, a reporter or a photographer who works for a large media agency, they're going to get more, uh, more attention, more coverage. Um, what they were trying to achieve by the, uh, the execution uh, of the journalists is a little bit more complicated to discern, right? Um, that, that, that we would have to delve into the sort of strategic thinking of the organizations. Some people say the, that ISIS's beheading of journalists was to try and provoke the United States into um, uh, getting involved in the conflict in Iraq again. My personal belief is actually uh, the opposite. The, the beheadings occurred after the United States had begun uh, bombing campaigns against ISIS and that ISIS wanted to um, uh, deter the United States from becoming uh, more involved in the conflict and perhaps reduce um, sort of the, the drumbeat for, for war that might have been occurring in a lot of media outlets. If we talk about uh, large-scale terrorist attacks, uh, there was a particular attack in 1983 in Beirut when we had a marine installation there as um, peacekeeper forces. And uh, as part of that civil war, uh, things became uh, very dicey, as they say. And uh, the, ultimately, the Beirut Marine Base was attacked with a truck bomber, suicide bomber, who ended up killing 241 of our servicemen. Uh, very complicated situation. Ultimately, we determined in U.S. court, in a U.S. court, a judge determined that Iran was actually responsible for this, for sponsoring, aiding, and abetting uh, a group known as Islamic Jihad, which was uh, a precursor to Hezbollah. What do we make of that situation, and how did we respond to that? Right. Well, um, whether or not that was a, a terrorist attack is, is debatable. Um, certainly, as you said, the United States government and a U.S. court considered it a terrorist attack. Um, uh, and certainly Iran has been sort of found guilty of supporting that precursor to Hezbollah. Now, the, the, the targets weren't civilians. They were um, combatants who were involved in a peacekeeping operation. And um, some people argue that they had been uh, actually involved in active conflict against one side in the Lebanese Civil War. So um, uh, it's a gray area in terms of whether it was terrorism or not. Um, but what's interesting to me is the, if you compare the response at the time to uh, our response today to terrorism, it really shows how, um, how, how, how much terrorism has sort of uh, become the primary national security threat in the minds of Americans. 
You'll recall that uh, Ronald Reagan, after the attack, withdrew the United States from the civil conflict uh, in Lebanon after this, ma this massive attack against the Marine barracks. Um, or if th something like this had happened today, we probably would see a, uh, an escalation uh, uh, of the United States, getting more involved in the civil conflict um, because terrorism is viewed as much more threatening, um, in a way more, more heinous than it used to be viewed, uh, and also the underlying ideology of the group that carried out the attack, which was an Islamic fundamentalist uh, organization, uh, is also viewed as a major security threat to the United States. So whether or not that was a, a, you know, a terrorist attack, terrorism is a, is a word that we, we label something with. Um, we, we can certainly say it was a, you know, a heinous attack against U.S. service people. The response to me is more interesting than the labeling of the attack. We can really see how the U.S. perception of threat towards terrorism and these type of asymmetric guerrilla attacks has changed uh, from the 80s to today. We only have a couple minutes before the break, but I wanted to ask you about uh, previous decades. Uh, in the 1970s and into the 1980s, there was a spate of hijackings that were occurring. Oftentimes, these were hijackings where the uh, hijackers wanted to fly to Cuba or some other country that they figured was hostile to the U.S. where they wouldn't be extradited. Uh, but oftentimes, the demands were about money, ransom. Other times, it was about prisoner releases and things of that nature. Um, what, how did we deal with terrorism at that time, and, and did we learn anything, and has our, has our philosophy evolved since then? Um, well, ag again, this is, um, it's interesting to compare terrorism from the 60s and 70s to terrorism today. And what we'd, we'd label that terrorism uh, at, in the academic world as is demonstrative terrorism. It, and again, it was mostly about getting the group's uh, grievance out, its ideology, um, maybe its long-term objectives. But the objective it wasn't to uh, kill as many people as possible, right? It was actually to try and avoid um, uh, civilian casualties to an extent. Um, uh, I think the, the United States response, the U United States' stated policy to terrorism has you know, always been that the United States government will not negotiate with terrorist organizations for fear that that would set a, a precedent, right? If you gave in to one terrorist group's demands, then uh, the idea is many other groups would emerge carrying out sim similar activities, uh, uh, expecting a similar response by the United States. So I think overall the United States has tried to, for the most part, not negotiate with terrorist groups. Um, there are instances, though, back then and today, where maybe the United States has capitulated uh, a little bit, right? Um, in 1969, the United States ambassador to uh, Brazil was kidnapped by uh, a, an insurgent terrorist group there. Um, and the, uh, the ambassador was ultimately returned. But the government of, of Brazil, uh, ne negotiating and talking to the United States, um, released prisoners uh, and aired the group's grievances over the public airwaves in Brazil. I'm going to have to stop you right there because uh, we've hit the midpoint. Uh, stay with us. When we come back, we'll finish this story, and then we'll also talk about homegrown domestic terrorism. Stay with us. We have a job to do out here today. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work's going into this. This is what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. The action team. Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Charles Mahoney, and we're talking about the definition of terrorism today. And Charles, before we went to the break, you were talking about an incident in 1969 where an ambassador to Brazil was uh, kidnapped and uh, we did negotiate ultimately in that case, even though our stated policy is that we don't negotiate. We see examples of this even today where uh, one of our servicemen, Bo Bergdahl, was captured, held for several years, and there was a swap, a prisoner swap, where we released five Taliban members to, to receive him uh, in return. Mm -hmm. So it does happen on occasion where we do some negotiating. Right, I think that a negotiation can happen through back channels over specific limited issues um, where both sides want to achieve very small objectives. It, it typically doesn't happen as the result of a, of a major attack. 
or over a, a major policy issue. That is, ma large scale policy changes uh, typically do not occur as the, the result of, uh, of terrorism. So on these limited prisoner swaps, um, we might see it, but not on a big policy issue. Going back to Beirut, because that was, seemed to be the center of all of the activity in the, in the 1980s, uh, there was a TWA airliner, an American TWA airliner, that was uh, hijacked by a terrorist group that, re that held the hostages and had a number of demands. What happened in that case that you recall? Um, well, uh, in Beirut in the 80s, you know, you had Hezbollah um, kidnapping um, many, uh, many Americans, um, uh, journalists, diplomats. Um, and again, this was an effort to um, gain attention for the organization um, uh, and to sort of draw international uh, spectacle and acclaim to the uh, conflict in Lebanon. Uh, and, you know, by this time, the, the larger conflict in the Middle East um, uh, between Israel, Palestine, uh, uh, and, and those issues. So I think, again, it was uh, an effort to, to draw the world's attention um, to this tension and conflict uh, in the Middle East. And we know from the Iran-Contra scandal that uh, we do um, covert negotiations, uh, back channel. That was what Oliver North was involved in, in trying, trying to trade arms for hostages with Iran. Right. Well, the United States has often gone into cahoots with um, uh, uh, less than uh, idyllic partners, right? Uh, insurgent groups, guerrilla groups during the Cold War who were fighting communism, right? We saw that with the, uh, the Contras um, uh, in Nicaragua and the Mujahideen uh, in Afghanistan who were fighting against the Soviet Union, right? Who we were partners with while, while the Cold War was going on, but who after the Cold War ended have turned out to be the origins for many of the uh, Islamic fundamentalist terrorist groups we're um, fighting against today. Uh, and you know, neither of those, neither the Contras nor the Mujahideen uh, were necessarily uh, you know, noble warriors, to, to say the least, um, especially the Contras in Nicaragua, who carried out uh, a lot of terrorism against the civilian population there. Um, uh, so uh, the United States often gets involved with um, organizations, guerrilla groups, even terrorist organizations, when it, it suits uh, its interests. I wanted to talk about uh, the concept of terrorist versus freedom fighter, and is this an example of, of taking moral equivalence to an extreme when someone says, well, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter? Um, it, it's used, the, the term, you know, terrorism is used to um, uh, denigrate our enemies, and freedom fighters used to support groups that we think are fighting for a good cause. but. Terrorism, uh, ha I mean, this is what we started with, has a set definition. And if uh, an individual, an organization, or a country is carrying out uh, attacks against civilian non-combatants to try and achieve their objective, that's terrorism. And the, their goal, whether it's uh, a, a noble goal or uh, sort of an evil goal, um, doesn't really matter. And I don't necessarily think it, it uh, you know, you can't justify terrorism. The ends don't justify the means, right? Um, any anytime you're targeting uh, civilian non-combatants, there is a, a moral or ethical, serious moral or ethical problem to that, even if the goal, we consider it a good one. And we've seen examples of homegrown terrorists here in the United States. Uh, the classic example, I guess, would be the Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing, which happened in 1995, where Timothy McVeigh was um, sort of a lone wolf, I guess, but he had, in his mind, he was affiliated with a so-called militia movement at that time. And his bombing of the Oklahoma City building was to try to spark a new American revolution. But of course, people were so horrified by what happened there and the loss of life, and there were children in that building because there was a daycare center, that there was no chance that the American people were going to join forces with Timothy McVeigh or anyone like that. Uh, what about the... Uh, domestic side of terrorism and the, and the lone wolves that are out there. Right. Um, well, we have the, the Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh, and we have the, the Unabomber. Um, Timothy McVeigh would consider to be a, a right-wing uh, terrorist, right? His uh, ultimate objective was decreasing the influence and scope of the federal government over uh, you know, the rest of America. He viewed the federal government as having um, grown too large and bloated and 
uh, was concerned with its uh, operations in Waco, Texas. Um, and there all, there's also a history of um, left-wing terrorism in the United States. In the, in the 60s, we had the, the organization, the Weather Underground, who didn't kill civilians, but still carried out limited um, military-style attacks or bombings um, on property, right? So uh, domestically, terrorism can come from the right or the left, and we also have um, uh, you know, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism today. Lone wolf terrorists are probably rarer than other types of terrorists because it's terrorism to carry out attack takes resources, planning, knowledge. Um, so it's, it's rare, but the dangerous thing about lone wolves, and you know, we could even consider the Boston bombing, perhaps it, there's two of them, but similar to a lone wolf attack, is that it's hard to uh, root, root them out because they're operating by themselves or maybe with one other person. Um, uh, it's harder for intelligence organizations, law enforcement to find them, um, to discover what they're planning and when the attack will be carried out. So lone wolves probably are less dangerous than organizations, but uh, it's more difficult to stop those types of attacks because they're, they're operating alone. And uh, you mentioned the Unabomber as well, and the Unabomber, of course, had his manifesto, which was only discernible to him. <laughs> but uh, when someone has a manifesto like that and they're carrying out um, their opinion of what needs to be done, um, how can they be stopped? Um, well, the Unabomber, I don't think he, he would have stopped until he, until he was, was dead. Um, but you, interesting that you mention his manifesto because he was successful in getting his manifesto uh, or portions of it printed uh, in the New York Times and Washington Post. It was widely discussed, broken down, analyzed. Um, uh, it's, still, it's still written about today. And it, it was largely unintelligible, but we do, you know, you can glean from it his major social grievance, and that's what made his attacks terrorism, was that he was upset about the role uh, modernity and technology were playing on sort of on society. Um, he felt that it was sort of making, making us a, um, a wimpy society in a lot of ways. Um, and that was his grievance. And he was successful in, in getting that grievance aired. And so I think for him, that was a, 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 he obtained sort of a limited success in that his, what he found wrong with society was discussed and presented to the world. Ultimately, all of these things have led to an environment where we have more surveillance, we have more uh, checking on emails, and some people call it snooping, on emails by the National Security Administration, and uh, we've had the Edward Snowden um, revelations. Uh, where are we headed with all of this? Well, it's interesting to think about the response to terrorism. Um, uh, Counterterrorism in the United States has become a huge industry. Right, involving not only the government but also a lot of private contractors, and um, we're spending billions upon billions of dollars. The CIA, the NSA, uh, the Defense Department, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security to prevent um, what could be considered limited-scale terrorist attacks. These are attacks that are awful and horrible uh, and evil, but they're not attacks that could uh, threaten our way of life in the United States uh, to, a, to, to a large degree. Um, even so-called ideas like dirty bombs and suitcase nu nukes, which are um, you know, not necessarily possible today, um, and terrorist groups certainly don't have these capabilities now, um, wouldn't change sort of the fundamental ways of life we have in the United States. Um, so counterterrorism, uh, a lot of money being spent on it, and the negative side of it is that we're giving up a lot of the freedoms um, and liberties that the country was founded on, um, which is exactly what we say the terrorists are trying to do to us. So in a way to achieve our goal of not um, having more terrorist attacks domestically, we're giving up the very freedoms we're supposed to be protecting. Interestingly enough that even with all of the technology that we have to try to uh, identify terrorists from phone calls, emails, etc., that a lot of times it really comes down to an informant who knows of an individual who's planning an attack or has some uh, knowledge of what's going to happen. In the case of the Unabomber, I believe it was his own brother mm -hmm. who ultimately turned him in. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to speak with uh, the director of the FBI operations in Los Angeles uh, in the federal building in Westwood. And he told me, this was about seven years ago, that the reason why we haven't had more spectacular uh, 
terrorist events here in California and around the country is because the people that have moved here from parts of the world that are rife with terrorism don't want that here. Mm. And if they see members of the community that are moving in that direction, they're going to tell the authorities because mm -hmm. people move here to have a better life. They want a better education. They want their children to have an opportunity to live in a safe neighborhood and a safe city and, and to have a normal life. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's, that's right. The public is much more aware about the threat of terrorism today than in the past. Um, we, you know, we hear about it every day in the media, in the newspapers, and we're, we're, in tol we're told or instructed or educated about how to respond to su suspicious activity and what might constitute suspicious activity. And you're probably right that that's the best way to prevent terrorist attacks, right? For the, terrorists will pro probably be discovered not by the NSA or the CIA or the FBI initially, but by somebody who knows them. And if that person reports them to, the law, to law enforcement, that's probably how they're gonna be caught. So I think that, that that's an excellent point. And a lot of counterterrorism um, can be done you know, at a local community, even family friend level, right? Um, uh, rather than maybe at the uh, institutional or organizational level. We only have a minute left. Real quickly, 30 seconds are left. Um, future efforts uh, by the evolving security administration here in the United States, what will they entail? Well, I, th I think what we should be worried about um, with respect to a terrorist attack is the potential unknown unknown, right? Pearl Harbor was an unknown unknown that we didn't expect. 9-11 was an unknown unknown that we didn't expect. And I think that a lot of counterterrorism work today is sort of brainstorming, thinking like a terrorist, trying to imagine not the attack that we expect, but the attack that we don't expect, which may be uh, a cyber attack um, uh, or something, you know, something else that we, we, haven't, seen, we haven't seen coming. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of what is being done by counterterrorism ex experts today. It's not necessarily trying to prevent the shoe bomber on a plane, but the large scale uh, potentially damaging attack um, that, uh, that's coming uh, you know, sort of through the back door, not the front door. Charles, we've run out of time, but thank you for joining us and sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thanks for having me here on Talking Points. It was a great experience. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm.